Great. Well, welcome back to the final session. This is a fish bowl. We've got two invited fish to start. Um, and we've got two spare places. The rules about a fish bowl is that you're short and concise and contribute something. Uh, it can follow on from what somebody else has said, but it can be something completely new. The aim of this session, as I mentioned just before lunch, is to reflect on the process that we've been through, but also think about the takeaways you have, some of the worries, concerns, gaps, but also excitements and enthusiasms that, that have been generated. So be honest, be subterranean in uh, <laughs> Sheila's terms. Um, and don't feel remotely intimidated about coming up to the front. It's absolutely fine. Um, the, uh, After you. The, we'll run it for as long as it takes. We would really appreciate some feedback also on, you know, where does this conversation go now? I mean, we had a fantastic, confusing, overwhelming, disturbing few days, but, you know, is there mileage in, in, in this continuing in other ways? And if so, in what ways? So that would be also useful. So the rules are, so when, once you have finished your contribution, you leave and find a seat. Okay? The room? Not the room. You leave the, 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 uh, the country again. You leave your spaces here, and you can go and sit down. You can come back if you want but that's up to you. Um, and we really do encourage as many people to contribute as possible, including those, as I mentioned, who haven't been presenting, who haven't been either plenary speakers or theme speakers, those who've contributed as bloggers and others, but just feel free. But anyway, we, the two invited fish are Silke, Beck, and Lila Mehta, who are going to open the process, and uh, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> so, we should go on a slide with fish with our well, coffee and yeah. <laughs> No, we're sorry about the very, very British approach to no coffee after dinner and after lunch. Yeah. So, um, I want to, to yeah, I, I want to ask a question which was taken up in the first session on the Wednesday, and it's the question of what is our political message or how do we engage in and with conflicts and I guess if we if we perform this mode of humility or civility, responsibility, challenge things that are taken for granted, um, are we creating our own world or whatever free bubble, a closed world or free <coughs> in certain few researches and other people um, living in other worlds may say this is a risky discourse, it's not useful, it's undermining trust in science, it's delaying action when it comes to climate change. So my first question would be how do we engage with ongoing and emerging discourses? And one discourse that is driving to me is the discourse and on Enlightenment 2.0. It's represented by the Joint Research Commission of the European Union, but also by people like um, Stephen Pinker. He talks about real risk and undeniable progress. And I um, guess this emerging eco modernist discourse um, blaming, for instance, unrational or irrational German for their resistance against nuclear power or waste of disposal, saying that it's unresponsible or irresponsible and um, challenging this kind of technology or make, making or having worries concern about waste disposal and things like that. And I can also see that there is an emerging discourse which merge with this kind of technological discourse, which is called behavioral science, or in short, nudging. And this nudging, um, nudging is a sort of technology that fits very well to new emerging technological infrastructures like artificial intelligence. And it's often used when it comes to smart farming or smart agriculture or smart cities in order to implement these novel technologies. And this, um, this discourse is based on um, reinforcing what we call the deficit model and the 
an idea or a linear model of change. And um, it's also performative in that sense that it creates um, something like a default option. Um, we have um, design architecture that are setting default rules, and this means that um, they try to turn things, aspects that should be taken for granted. So um, it's a political intervention which is contributing to narrowing down the spectrum of choices, but also reducing the space for justification and deliberation. And this is a very dominant ongoing discourse, often reinforced by monocultures of as was the friend monocultures before, and the IPCC is one of the sites who is cultivating this kind of monostructural discourses. The IPCC, and this is my second point, I try to um, link the discussion to the discussion on transformation. The IPCC um, provides no sound scientific <coughs> evidence um, for a rapid far reaching um, transformations, but, but there is also a risk that this discourse could be used by the new emerging class of technocrats. Um, for justifying really technologically driven cha um, change. So the question I want to raise here is how could we rethink about agency and public discourse in this emerging alternative discourses? How can we raise um, alternative ways of thinking about transformations? And um, the question here is also, um, how can, could we rise quite normative question of choice, but also about representation that, um, for instance, um, when it comes to climate engineer, engineering, people like David Keith, um, they think they have to speak for the global south and the most vulnerable. And so the question is, how can we open up this kind of discourses that women people get the voice and are not represented by some northern technocrats. Thank you very much. Pass the mic. Spare seats. Anyone can come. Anything that has uh, been provoked in you, please feel free at any moment to come and take a seat. Okay, great. Well, I can't swim to you guys, sorry. Uh, so you have to see my back. <laughs> Anyway, um, I like the fishbowl. I, I, I was at a wonderful fishbowl in Germany, so I, I hope this one will be the same. I, um, I wanted to start, since we spoke about different understandings of uncertainty, I'll just start with a, a Zen take on uncertainty. Um, so uncertainty is the foundation of our lives. Can we be at home there, practicing the limitless qualities of loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, not harming? can help us live our lives as a continuous blossoming into the unknown. Um, so if that's, uh, it would be nice if we kind of leave this place with this kind of embracing the unknown. But obviously there are a lot of politics and complexities around embracing the unknown, and I want to focus on a few things that I have learned over here and also some questions. Uh, so the first point is about the different types of uncertainties. We spoke about them uh, a lot, and I think in the Step Center we had largely focused on the epistemological, but I think you know, opening up to the ontological, uh, the inherent randomness and dynamics in life worlds, the practices, um, even the sort of aleatory aspects, the institutional complexities and how these increase uncertainties um, are all something that I think they all cascade together and make a huge difference uh, to people who are affected by them or have to respond to them. Uh, the other dilemma is about uh, the, the relationship between uncertainty and certainty. Um, and Sheila spoke about this post-truth world. I recognize there was never one truth, but I guess we're coming to that stage now where um, even you know secular and plural voices are being marginalized. Um, you know, in India, for example, Gandhi's killer is now being resurrected as a hero. Um, so you know, there's limits to the kind of plurality or how we can embrace these diverse constructions. Um, and so I guess that also, so, so you know, where does the expert fit into this? Do we have to re-question some of those things? Uh, what do we do as so-called uh, experts that are increasingly being marginalized today? Um, the other role is about, the other issue I think is about how experts deal with, you know, the science policy interface because the policymakers want certainty uh, to make decisions. 
maybe also to get re-elected. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, one wants caution. So when does one communicate with certainty about certain things? And when does one step back? There's been quite a lot here about the manufacture and politicization of uncertainty. Um, and that colonizes the future in certain ways. So uh, the uncertainty of climate change is used to evict uh, poor people uh, from the coastline, from mangroves, um, often, in the, often to beautify the city, but out goes certain disposable people. Uh, financial uncertainty is used to undermine uh, the pensions in the UK, for example, and there's all this stuff around the strikes. So there's a nexus between these different uncertainties and there are compounding vulnerabilities. And what was nice in this workshop that we saw how uh, issues of health, of climate change, of disaster are all interlinked and how they intersect with each other. So climate change intersects with neoliberal trajectories of growth and resource grabbing uh, to increase vulnerabilities and uncertainties of certain populations. And then you have really the politics of attribution where you have the real culprit is taken off the hook. So the lack of development, or the lack of water and sanitation facilities is what actually creates disaster injustices. Uh, but instead you kind of blame the whatever, the, the one event, or climate change is blamed for water scarcity um, instead of for water management. What was also good, I thought what was interesting was scales of temporality. So you have different domains in our project, climate change, uncertainty and transformation, uh, we looked at the so-called above, middle, and below, and there's lots of complexities in these domains. And I guess what struck me at, at, this, at the end of this meeting was that while people at, in, you know, on the ground are living with different uncertainties in multiple ways, and they are embracing them, uh, when we talk, many of them actually want certainty. You know, they want certainty in their lives. They want a certain certainty in water and sanitation supply. They don't necessarily want to be moving around every second day um, uh, for tenure security, uh, for food, for water, etc. So in that sense, maybe we're talking about the above, the policy makers, the planners that actually need to embrace it. But maybe we need to talk about a different type of embracing um, from, from below. Um, also, when we talk about, we spoke a lot about practices uh, that enable and, and help people embrace uncertainty. For example, mobility is a resource for pastoralists. Um, but on the other hand, and it's not just something to be constrained, uh, refugee protection should actually be about enhancing mobility as a way to deal with uncertainties in the global south, and not actually a way of keeping, keeping people outside Europe um, <coughs> or you know, in, in southern Europe somewhere in, on an island stuck forever. Um, so in that sense, this embracing uncertainty is at a certain level to prevent certain interventions. So for example, concrete embankments, um, they support the construction industry, they're supposed to help deal with flooding, but in in actually they breach, they don't increase resilience, they mess up uh, the ecology. And finally, some points on um, decolonizing uncertainty. Should we raise that in our group? Um, and I think we had some interesting discussions of what this decolonizing means for different groups. So for modelers, um, it would mean you know, acknowledging the social life of these models, the history, the culture, uh, what gets simulated or not, who decides, where does the data come from. Um, also this opening up, can modelers engage with other actors? And there were some examples in our cluster of modelers working with uh, different communities to understand what should go in that model. Uh, but this is also about acknowledging humility and ignorance. So, you know, what can actually go into those models or not? There are certain things that just can't go in, uh, land grabs or policy shifts, etc. And, you know, modelers often say, oh, we can simulate that if we need to. We can just add the variable. But maybe there are certain limits to that. Um, it's also about decolonizing the future. So in that sense, to think about post-capitalist sort of features where we're living with uncertainty uh, and new forms of environmental and social justice. And there was a lot of talk in these few days about the role of the emotions, um, the affect, uh, and new imaginaries. So I want to now end with this whole issue of um, uncertainty as opportunity. Uh, so I guess here you're talking about the realm of imagination, and it's not just the imagination from below, but it's governments, non-state actors, scholars, uh, reimagining their life worlds in ways that embrace uncertainty. So it's also linked to hope. So for example, refugees, you know, hope for a better world. They embrace the uncertainty of deportation, asylum, even death. You know, they make these perilous journeys in these boats. 
in hope uh, for a more secure future. But their mobility, as I said is, earlier, is not celebrated, it's clamped down. The uncertainty that they embrace is not something that we want to encourage, for example. Um, but hope can also mean, oh, we don't really need to do anything, because you may have this disease, and there's this uncertainty about disease outcomes, but if there's certain hope, it means, okay, maybe, fine, we leave it to God, you know? We hear that a lot in our fieldwork. We don't need to do anything, because God will take care of us, or, you know, we leave it to the universe, etc. So there there's the role of understanding these different constructions, the role of storytelling, art, uh, theater, performance. We spoke a lot about that, how some of these different uh, creative methodologies can help in this reimagining. Re and I guess if you create these spaces where these different actors, stakeholders, but maybe where the stakes are equal, if that's possible, um, you know, find the space where everybody reimagines um, and you know, maybe one can then find new ways of being. Um, and I guess as Teresa said, here the process is more important than the final output. So it's not whether we come up with an artwork or a theater performance, but it's actually you know, the process of creating and co-creating that. Uh, we have, like Silka, we, we have a project called Tapestry. Uh, the idea is we're looking at little patches of transformation that will uh, ultimately form a tapestry. It's, um, it's in it's South, India, uh, South Asia. India and Bangladesh, and um, we're looking at these hybrid alliances and ways in which local people, uh, civil society, scientists can come together. So some examples are, you know, uh, new forms of breeding, swimming camel, which is dying in, in Kutch, you know, whether different groups can work around uh, reviving that breed, looking at milk production as a way to actually uh, deal with uncertainties in the drylands. Uh, that's one example. So I guess we're just starting out, and for me, uh, the challenge in all these spaces, there's a lot of talk about the translators, the middle, uh, the, the, the me intermediaries. So if we see ourselves, if, if this is a space like that, where a lot of the middle is coming together, where we as mediators and translators are coming together, I guess for us, there's a big role in, um, firstly, you know, what are the methodologies that we're going to collectively develop uh, to do this reimagining? Re how can we deal with some of the, um, the wider issues of political economy, of uh, power, of gender, of incumbency? Um, also, you know, who is actually doing the reimagining, the capacity to reimagine, um, and also being a little realistic about uh, the limits to agency, you know, the limits to different people's agency to actually deal with some of these hard, big, whatever uncertainties um, that, we, that we've spoken about. So I hope we can do some of this uh, reimagining and do some of this stuff here. And I'll leave the fishbowl now. <laughs> space is open. Thank you. <clears throat> you don't have to speak for as long as I do the two. All right. So <laughs> inspiration we for uh, okay. your comments. But anyway, go for it. And the, the spaces are filled, so come up if you would like. What I'd like to do is uh, set the kitchen among the cats. And I'm going to give an example of a report that has been uh, recently published talking about one of the topics that was raised in our, at least in our cluster. And uh, I am not asking for the individual disciplinary views uh, with respect to analyzing this kind of report. I think we can, we could do this, it's being done. But I'm asking, what is the value added of this workshop to critiquing or responding to this report? This report is uh, published in the last month or so. It's on uh, worldwide species extinction. Many of you may have seen it in the newspaper. Its headline was a million species at risk, uh, and so on. I'm not critiquing it going for the headline use or the, uh, the use, uh, uh, sort of summary use of this. But, uh, and I'm not going to critique it for uh, did they get the numbers right down to the decimal point, uh, or did they get the um, uh, orders of magnitude right. I'm going to ask you, though, think of what we've been talking about for the last two days and how you would respond to this. Um, this is a report by a set of, uh, set of scientists, and we all know who made reports by scientists. 
That's not my critique. I'm not worried about that. Um, but it uses a very uh, familiar called the four box model for qualitative communication of confidence. So uh, those of you who have not seen this is there are categories, these kinds of reports have a series of so-called empirical observations uh, uh, from the literature, and they want to rank it in terms of confidence. And uh, the categories are established but incomplete. This is this result. So you have a finding, you rate it in four terms, uh, established but incomplete, well-established, unresolved, and inconclusive. This is a 40-page report that managed through hundreds of different empirical findings without finding any one inconclusive, okay? What they found were established but incomplete findings, uh, well-established findings, unresolved findings, and inconclusive, and no conclusive findings. So again, now I want to take the value added from this. Uh, and please, again, I want to focus on what we've been talking about today and perhaps see if, if I can pick up some insight on how to analyze this. But it is isn't incredible that for a globe as being the most complex ecosystem with complex interconnectivity and uh, massive, massive uh, dynamics that there wouldn't be inconclusive information. So what I am saying, see, what I've learned from this, uh, if you will, workshop is among the many things you could critique it for is that I should be worried about when they say well-established, for example, finding, who are they excluding? What kind of data, uh, what kind of findings that we've been talking about, the diversity, uh, situated knowledge, impact, uh, of species extinction. So I would ask of the three categories that were uh, identified, uh, what, what is being systematically excluded, what's been excluded so they could get to where they want. But I'm also picking up, uh, and this is not to credit Brian only, but the sense of the creation of ignorance, when in fact where a topic is difficult is this, when they cannot find one inconclusive finding about which they're about confidence, that we are in danger, at least from a policy or management sense, of creating agents. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm thankful that's not very big sunset. Um, throughout the last couple of days, I've been reflecting on Partially how fun this experience has been, um, which which does like and isn't just a compliment. Um, it is, thank you. Um, but I want to, to start by linking imagination and creativity with an idea that came up in the plenary about sandboxes of urban experimentation um, and something that came up in our cluster and seemed to be a cross cutting thing about the kind of emotional aspects of uncertainty and, and through the kind of unbridled expressiveness and hope of children. Um, I want to try and link them through ideas of a sense of play in uncertainty. So the idea that uncertainty is not just a kind of space for very serious questions of how we create certainty, how we um, formulate ideas, how do we act in spaces where things are highly and inherently uncertain, but particularly, um, or at least in my reflection, really found, uncertainty was, was also a, a, a sense of play. I had uncertainties about how certain things were going to turn out, and so I would play with ideas about them. Um, and so through kind of playfulness, you can also start to link this in with, with ideas of collaboration and participation. The idea that play and fun brings people together and lowers barriers. Um, and it, it, it gives collaboration this kind of capacity to, to not just be um, a, a, a space where people collect ideas and come together, but, but also where they have fun. 
and it encouraged them to repeat those activities. Um, and so initiatives like this, where you, you get to be a little bit silly and make fun jokes, most likely at his expense, um, or in the middle of a fishbowl, um, kind of help us to, to bridge these gaps that are more than just cognitive, but can sometimes be either cultural or social. Um, and that sense of play can help us bridge the sociality um, or the social distance that we have. I, um, I want to respond uh, to, to your um, equation of uh, behavioral science, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be a bit closer. Um, it's not that I disagree with some of the things that you said around matches. I think you, some of the ethical issues you identified are, 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 are really there, and I agree with that. Um, although I, would, I think I would say that if we view nudge theory in a different kind of way, which is as drawing attention to choice architectures as an object of study, um, there are other ways in which we might approach the study of choice architectures, for example, you know, just as we have sensitivity to the ways in which people <laughs> exercise power through the control of the language in which uh, that debate can be exercised, uh, people can exercise power through subtle influences and choice action architectures, for example. But we all face we all face choice structures in our environments. Um, uh, so, so the question there is a, 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 the ethical question, I think, is about um, exercising power through influencing those choice architectures in those kinds of ways. Uh, I think that's a different layer of inquiry. But there's a lot else going on in, in various kinds of painful science. So I think nudges sit uh, nicely within the, the whole judgment and decision-making area, which by and large has studied uncertainty as risk and has studied risk as essentially a set of gambling tasks. In, often in the laboratory, um, uh, other, uh, other elements of behavioral science, of uh, cognitive science and so on, um, have been much more interested in, uh, for example, naturalistic decision making, studying uh, expert decision making in fields, seeing where people who make decisions in uh, expert contexts, um, and come to different, very different kinds of conclusions. Um, I, you know, and of course, you know, many people are especially familiar with the debate between people like Giga Enzo and uh, Carmen Tversky over, uh, well, uh, the, that debate is about um, the uses of biases and heuristics. Carmen Tversky, well known for identifying biases and heuristics, which they claim are mostly harmful to uh, people's effective decision making. Giga Enzo's point is that once you get out of the laboratory, those biases and heuristics either disappear in the real world or more often turn out to be remarkably useful uh, because we're because they're forms of adaptive decision making. I don't want to open up a discussion about nudging. I'm afraid this is a sociologist, and, and I guess a lot of um, ways how sociologists think about how institution work or institutionalization works. Is included in this kind of idea of having a choice architecture. My main point was um, if the architecture is designed, it should be open to choice, meaning that what kind of choices are taken or are implicit in designing this kind of architecture. Also, asking the question who is the architecture? Who decides? On what legitimacy? This kind of discourse of justification, if it's implemented in policy making, this kind of discourse should be opened. Also, um, the question of agency, which is re-enabled by this kind of discourses. And it's pretty obvious that, for instance, when it comes to behavioral science, they reproduce the deficit model, expert design, because people are stupid, so um, expert have to decide what's rational for stupid people. And um, for instance, Giga Renzer, he has a different model of agency. It's more deliberative of a learning subject and things like that. And if we buy into such a discourse, I guess we should challenge the underlying uh, assumption, asking what kind of models of agency, of representation, are we buying into? 
And when it comes to the European Union, the snatching discourse is quite dominant. And then often in, in cases such as um, designing rules for enabling artificial intelligence, they are based on this matching model, very implicit. And I guess this discussion should be opened up and discussed in a more legitimate way. You're not, you're not allowed to do this. I'm, I'm going to say one more thing, one more thing, and then <laughs> uh, just, just, that, just that at the, cent at, at the centre of this is the benchmark it, 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 that, that's attractive to the European Union is this rational expectations model of, of economists, and uh, Thaler and people like that sit very close to it. So that's one of the reasons why it seems to be so attractive because of the dominance of e economists in policy discourse. Yeah. Right. I'm sitting there and my eyes were glazing over. Uh, how many people here are not working in academia? Uh, yes, that's what it's felt like. And you're tired, you don't work technically, maybe. <laughs> okay, two inches at least. Um, so uh, on Monday afternoon, I was asked by uh, somebody who's uh, leading our internal strategy for the next five years, saying, Irena, by Friday, I want you to tell me what poverty is going to look like by 2030. Okay, so that's my reality. Um, I said, I now have, I, I now know that I can do a sanity check on this question, right? Um, I knew that it was an insane question, but I now have academics who said that it's an insane question. Um, I think there's two things that I, three things that I take away back to Oxfam. One is, uh, or frankly, any grounded organization that is not, doesn't have a luxury of reflection and theory. Um, on a daily, on a daily, uh, in a daily rhythm, is one, we do a hell of a lot of stuff you guys are talking about, right? There is so much going on that we don't call it that, but it's there. So, um, and I would love to map it and to validate it that way, because I think we often feel incredibly insecure about what we're doing. And I've had a few conversations with people here where I said, well, what about this? And then they said, oh, well, can I suggest something? And I said, yeah, we're doing that, we're doing that, we're doing that, we're doing that. We don't call it that. So that's one thing. Is I, kept giving, I feel confident that we are doing stuff that is in the right direction, not good enough by a long shot and not enough. The second thing is, boy, I have to translate back to my practice who are on Monday, is uh, I've committed to doing a blog. <laughs> uh, my, my audience is going to be Oxfam, not you. Um, so, um, so I, and I think that there's a huge gulf uh, between how people are talking about it here and how it could become relevant. Um, I don't think it's hard to have that conversation. You just need different people in the room, slightly different balance than you have here. And maybe that's the next step of the conversation. Um, sec the, the last thing is, um, I would, how can we have a conversation with the funders? Because they demand of us um, certainties that are just bullshit. Um, plain, simple nonsense. And yes, we don't dare to speak up. We don't dare. So to what extent, how can we use the knowledge, the certainty about uncertainty, to challenge them about the certainty that they're demanding? And I'd love to figure that out with people. We need to go back to Dickens and say, look, it's crap. We need to go back to people and say, I say it's nonsense. Um, and it's not because we don't want to, because it's just not feasible or useful. Um, so that's, I guess, for me, the, the, the frontiers uh, for what I take away. Well, that took a big piece of mine. Uh, my, my first, I tried to follow, I was thinking of trying to follow the instructions for a change. And you know, what, what do I really, what do I really know now that, that I didn't, that I didn't know or surprised to learn? Actually, the existence of 95% of you <laughs> is, is what, you know, I know about six people well, so people that I can actually tag on Twitter, right? And, and I come from a, a different ecology. I feel like I'm from a different ecosystem of, uh, of ambiguity, uncertainty, whatever, on the other side of a ridge that somehow is separated from the vast majority of you. And some of the things that I've seen heard discussed, we think we solved long ago. Maybe we didn't. 
And other things that you discussed, we haven't even thought about at all. And that you know, the, the sort of the ability to, to, to bring those together somehow, I think would be very useful. And one way to do that is why aren't there more practitioners in this room? I didn't know the number to this a number ago, a minute ago. But what we do, especially on the communication side as well, is I, I mean I, I try to be a jargon chameleon. Right? It doesn't matter what I think the words mean. I try to understand what the practitioner thinks the words mean in a particular problem. And that, that actually helps develop these little sub devices of what we can actually do. And so I think so somehow getting these different groups, I didn't even, you know, we should have, we should have, you know, like I'm part of Cruz, and we should have talked about this a long time ago. But, because uh, Andy's one of the people that I know a long time. So and then what, what does the actual contribution to it might be made? Well, so one of the first ones is we, in my world, many, many, most people, the vast majority of people, are trying to put model-based probability distributions on everything. And then that forecast is useful to everyone. And it's not my fault. They just have to figure out what their risk tolerance is, right? What they want. And it, mathematically, this is a nonsense. It's merely given the structure of the models, the mathematical structure of the models that they're using. So we tried to put up this idea of getting just enough decisive information we focus on the question they're trying to answer. That happens to be Jedi. So we focus on the question, the one question that they're answering, and we really try to figure out what would they need to improve their decision making. And some of the answer is we just, we just can't go there. But often, for this particular question, you know, the, the sort of information is, it might not even have to do with forecasting or modeling. It could be to do with understanding the difference between mangroves and salt marsh. I mean, it could be very, very basic. And other times, there are things our models can give us with a relatively high, com with high confidence that we can actually quantify. So it's trying to turn, like, weather forecast, many of these things, model-based probabilities, on its head. Don't try to forecast the probability of everything. Look at what the practitioner actually needs in order to achieve or reduce the uncertainty. Ideally, get them just enough decisive information to make that decision. And, and, and just... The, the, that modeling in many places has gone in the private sector to very, very expensive, good, good people. And they will do that even if some of the traditional modelers for the last 50 years do. So trying to just shift that discussion. Uh, as many of you know this, I'm not actually here, but Ian gave me permission. I want to follow in the theme that Irene opened up, I hope to model brevity and the use of words in the same syllable. On Monday, I thought that much of what I heard, which was very exciting, could be summed up with the question, under what circumstances? Which leads us to the question of practice. How do we get to those circumstances? For me, that means diversity, of all kinds of diversity. And how do we, how do we situate ourselves so that we know we've actually gotten into the diversity that matters? The second, Lila quite um, correctly encouraged us to embrace the unknown today, which, for which there are two corollaries, both from Robert Chambers, and I'm sorry he's not in this room, along with the practitioners. Robert's corollary to that would be embrace error. And his practice corollary, which he actually did in Kenya, he went out, as many of you know, and apologized to the people for whom he had been making policy decisions. <clears throat> um, you have to take responsibility for your own. Oh, oh, it's Melissa. Hello. Oh my Hello. God, I'm so glad I'm not I, following you. No, 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 <laughs> I'm going to be special. Um, I'm going to go personal for a minute and then offer, offer a couple of reflections. So I've been trying to think about what's actually been slightly bothering me about this discussion. And I came into this meeting um, with some personal worries about two sorts of uncertainty. One of them, really personally, I harvested my annual hay crop last week. That is the one moment in the year when I have just an inkling of what it might be like to be a farmer trying to live from the land, facing uncertainties of weather. Can you mobilize labor? Is your contractor going to be available on the right day when the sun's shining? And a whole host of other things. It was extremely stressful. We bought it off, but only just. 
Secondly, as director of IDS, I'm currently worrying a lot about the uncertainties yes to do with Brexit, but more directly about what institutions in the UK are going to do about the crisis facing the pension scheme that we're all part of, um, which depend on a whole set of negotiations between the pensions regulator and the university superannuation scheme and the unions and the arcane decision making and negotiation that will happen which will bear down on what happens to the staffing, whether we face strike action next term or not, whether I can keep an institution financially sustainable and more or less happy and collegial. Very minor, these are rich person's problems, but I'm also working in contexts in villages in Africa where people are facing real hazards of conflict, of war, of major epidemics and outbreaks and so on. And all of that has just got me thinking that if we were to ask, going back to yesterday's discussion of risk society, if we were to say, okay, now we're in uncertainty society, what kind of a place, what kind of a world is uncertainty society? And I worry a little bit that we're being a bit celebratory about that because there are some real double faces. Um, is uncertainty society a place where we're able to escape from risk-based control? to realise opened up imaginative futures? Or is it a place where we're facing the loss of responsible security and the abrogation of responsibility by the institutions who might be expected to protect it? That's one double face. Is uncertainty society a place where single, dominant, powerful institutions have given way to this recognition of multiple diverse authorities um, which are creative and are, are responsive? Or is it actually a very confusing world where it's even harder to know where to turn and the very proliferation of institutions is adding to confusion and uncertainty? Is this uncertainty society a place where we, we've escaped this kind of god trick of a single illusory truth to a desirable world where we've got plural, partial perspectives, where everybody's acknowledging the diverse social orders with which they're co-constructed? Or is it actually ushering in a scary post-truth world where we've got a confusion of unrooted pseudo-facts and sound bites? They're amplified and pluralized further by social media and by this multiplicity of interactions which we seem to be embracing. Is uncertainty society a place where capitalism and financialization and neoliberalism are challenged by these transformative progressive possibilities we've been talking about? Or is it a place where actually capitalist institutions are profiting and feeding off and further constructing uncertainties? And finally, is uncertainty society, this imaginary society, a creative and welcoming place <coughs> where, to go back to Lila's Zen example, everyone is confidently imagining and embracing and enacting their, the desirability of the unknown? Or is it a place of constant anticipatory anxiety and stress? which goes back to my examples at the beginning. And I worry that it's often the latter, and I worry that for those living in real worlds of precarity, and directing IDS or managing a small holding hay crop in Kingston are not real precarity, don't get me wrong there, um, things are quite serious. So I just wanted to voice some slight concerns. I think we need to be careful about being celebratory. I think the answer to a lot of this is, of course, it's power stupid, and it depends on who you are. Those, in a way, are truisms, but let's keep going the sharp analysis. Let's keep going the analysis that reverts to examples, that asks those hard questions about the political economy of uncertainty in all its guises, and tries to do so in a language that's, that's, that's real. And I'm, my little intervention here has probably been overly academic for many in this room. Um, but I think that's where we need to go. So I think this has been a really excellent and welcome workshop, but, but there's more to do. But it's double-edged, and maybe uncertainty society is what we now need to start thinking about harder. There we go. Somebody else in it. That's very good. Um, so I'm Kate Crowley from Edinburgh. Um, I haven't met everyone, so I'm sure you haven't met me. So I thought I'd introduce myself. Um, I, as someone who's worked in disaster risk reduction for quite a few years in um, NGOs and in research institutes, um, coming here has been a really nice sort of space to think about uncertainty, but also a little bit shocking in terms that I naively thought everybody was on board with risk 
reduction and a risk model. And clearly not. <laughs> so I've been quite afraid to speak out because I believe I still believe in risk management and the risk of framework, but if it's done well, it can be empowering and it can save lives, ultimately. And so um, I think that there is this connect between some of the discussions that are taking place here and the practice on the ground. But just a couple of very brief reflections to think about, and they may be wrong, and that's fine. But um, uncertainty is also a really positive thing. And I've come across many decision makers who actually don't want certainty. Because if they have certainty, then they have responsibility. And so I think there's a connection there, and I'm not sure we've fully explored that, or at least maybe you have, and I just haven't understood the language. <laughs> um, and the other thing is around uh, culture and um, uncertainty, and I think there's something very interesting here, which is around there are certain cultures that don't want certainty, and it's actually quite rude to be certain. And so there's something there, I think, to be taken into account. Um, and just finally, uh, I think also it's, uh, we shouldn't reflect on each other's topics too harshly, and there are certain things and nuances in each sector that we have to be careful about. Um, but just to apply a little thing, um, as a disaster risk reduction person, um, there isn't such a thing as a natural disaster, and we have to be quite careful about the terminology that we use and share within these spaces, because it can um, create myths and uncertainties in themselves. I felt a bit I guess. Uh, just uh, to pick up on that point about terminology, I think what I'm going to take away from this really fascinating uh, conference is actually uh, the lesson to try to be more precise about uh, the language that we use, about different kinds of uncertainty. And um, I still hear uh, uncertainty, the word uncertainty being used for different kinds of uncertainty and certitude. Um, so, you know, being associated with IDS and the set center and knowing about Andy Sterling's work, you know, I was already familiar with the matrix of ignorance, ambiguity, etc. But I've also started thinking over the last couple of days, I've been introduced to other uh, thoughts about uncertainty such as imprecision, contingency, indeterminacy, and all of these things are distinct. And I, I just think my very simple lesson is like, uh, Any time I find myself wanting to talk about uncertainty, I need to be more careful about uh, what word I use and, for, and be more precise about uh, what, what the implications of that language and what it means. Yeah, and I like from the Danish Institute of International Studies. I'm going to scratch the underbelly just a little bit. Uh, so I think this has been super inspiring and also challenging. And one of the challenges is scale, I think, because we talk at so many different scales from the very individual. Uh, to the global, from the local to the global, and you know it can be difficult but necessary to have these scales uh, conversations between them. And then I'm a bit baffled that we are in more uncertain times than before. I think looking back just a few decades, like during the Cold War, was also uncertain. I had nightmares about nuclear bombings. There was a lot of intention to climate change also going further back in history, a lot of uncertainty of when do you die, I mean, how do you get food and all this. So I think that to say it's more uncertain now, I mean, there's certainly more attention to certain kinds of uncertainties perhaps, but that it should be like inherently more uncertain times now and before, I'm a bit skeptical. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Milstone. I work at the Science Policy Research Unit. And I just want to pick up from Melissa's concluding remark about power. Um, because while I've heard an enormous amount in the last few days about uncertainty, there's one thing that I hadn't heard that I was expecting to hear, which is that, but maybe it was said in a session that I wasn't attending, but incumbent powers often seek to exploit or handle uncertainty in a way which I think can accurately be characterized as consistently inconsistent. Namely, they highlight those uncertainties that serve their purposes and support their narrative and ignore or discount the uncertainties that don't. And therefore, one of the ways in which power can be exercised 
against those incumbent authorities is by revealing the ways in which they are consistently inconsistent.
perception of uh, danger. Sheila's uh, earlier remark about the subterranean tensions between the civilized discourse here. And it, it struck me that there is an underlying uh, unease between uh, theory and empirical cases and theory and practice. It's kind of come out of quite a number of the interventions this afternoon. And as a, as a philosopher, and worse still, partially an economist, I've been reminded I'm very usefully reminded of the importance of the analytical imagination or emotional skill in actually reading, inhabiting, and understanding practice-embedded webs of meaning uh, and emotional experiences of life. But I do think, and would still defend, and sometimes feel it needs defending, the critical use of language to open up new spaces for thought and reason about mutually intelligible differences between contextual or paradigm-specific language games. Leave it on there. Anybody else? See you then. So I wasn't wanting to do this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I live in a context, the Kennedy School of Harvard, but the umpteen times a week I hear the distinction between theory and practice. And the word practitioner as if it's a completely different thing. You know, I myself in my life am a practitioner in all kinds of ways. Uh, I've been a, I'm a woman, I've played various female roles, child rearing is a form of practice, uh, rearing when students take over from that, that is a form of practice. I don't know how many times I've pulled out Phoenix to give to students, you know, it's a form of practice when they're in despair. Uh, and of course, the kind of social theory I do is profoundly embedded in the social worlds that I've been studying. I mean, so in that sense, I've been an ethnographer of public policy. Um, and it's a field that's not inhabited by enough people. 
I mean, it is a little bit shocking to me that the fifth branch, my book from 1990 on advisory committees, still counts as a classic of the genre, even though our understanding of those phenomena uh, has moved on. And you know, I wish more people were doing that kind of work. And I think the reason that they don't is partly tied to this artificial distinction, fission theory and practice. I mean, I do think there are practices of theory and practices of practice that have something to do with the kind of temporality that we heard about you know, this notion that I can't wake up on Monday morning and listen to you guys complicating my world and I need to make a decision immediately. I mean, again, I don't know how many times I have heard that. But then, supposing you make that decision based on major reactions and build for about responses that are basically conditioned and framed by the last thing somebody did. And then, I mean, how can we be talking about transformation? in the same voice that we're glorifying practice as an end in itself, and more of a certain types of practice as being worthy of the term practice, and other types of practice not being worthy of the term practice. And the same goes for theory. I don't know any good practitioner who does not operate with, without a, in, you know, a theory of how the world works. And good theory is in the business of trying to dig out uh, what those presuppositions are among people and to clarify them. And sometimes there are radical differences. And I think some polarization in America today comes from the fact that we're not necessarily in a position to seek for the theoretical underpinnings of somebody else's set of positions that in some way have to do with their life in the ways in which they see themselves. So, so I think we should abandon that theory practice distinction and instead think about, you know, where we are more, most effective of ourselves. And, you know, Richard, what you said is, you know, was music pioneers and therefore I violated my original supposition that I would not come into the center of the <laughs> Yeah, I, I decided not to come to the center, but I, I feel, uh, you yeah. know, uh, and the point I want to address is, are we living in an age of exceptional uncertainty? Which is, I think it, it was phrased. Can you speak to me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, are we living in an in, in exceptional age of uncertainty? And assuming that there is a kind of, you can say, more uncertainty or less uncertainty. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I've been... Uh, Lately, uh, here, uh, uh, quoting uh, an Italian uh, philosopher and politician, Antonio Gramsci, uh, who for many reasons has become lately fashionable. So uh, uh, in his notebook from the uh, 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 prison, uh, he says, the old is dying, the new cannot yet emerge. And in the meantime, we, translation would be, we are witnesses all type of morbid effects. Okay? Uh, morbid, perhaps, in English is not the same meaning that in Italian, but could be all type of pathological effects. Now, everybody says, well, that describes well, well what is going on today. But actually, Gramsci wrote it a hundred years ago. So, uh, my point is that if a hundred years ago the old was dying, but actually still dying today, and the new could not emerge a hundred years ago, and still not emerging, perhaps the, the age of morbid and pathological effects is the norm. We always are <coughs> in between. It, <laughs> the old that is dying but doesn't die, and, and, and the new that is trying to emerge but cannot emerge. So in that sense, I would say I, I could go further back in history and show, so we are always in between. And uh, uh, so I think that this is important. And again, I have, it seems that I take it against the extinction, but it is not. I think uh, my point is that 
many people are worried about the end of the world. When in reality, the problem is the end of a world. Okay? I mean, Umberto Eco, in his name of the rose, had a monk, a, a Jorge, who represents Jorge de Borges, actually, who saw that the world was coming to an end. And a, the real world was coming to end, and the, 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 the fire in the library is a, a metaphor for that. But, of course, with hindsight, we thought that, okay, if the knowledge of moving from the monasteries to the, to the university, emerging universities, if the, if the life in the countryside was moving to the new emerging cities, if, if the economy was moving from land-based into commerce and so on and so forth. So he thought that it, he, the world was coming to an end when really a world was coming to an end. And I can give you many other examples. Plenty cool. The, the crow chief uh, who uh, argued, he said, when the buffalo didn't come back, then uh, history has ended. And then he said, because he was postmodern already, he said, oh, it, it's my history that is ending, but of course, there are other histories which I don't have the pleasure to tell. <laughs> so, uh, my, uh, so we have to be really careful uh, about that, about uh, thinking uh, in terms of, you know, are we going back from risk society, uh, uncertainty society, or anything better? We are in between, and we have always been in between. Okay? We are always in that situation. Okay. So I'm in the same camp of the person that was never going to come into the middle here and um, has been coaxed in here partly through, let's see if you agree, that maybe a potential um, omission from, from some of the conversations at least thus far. And um, I just had a quick check through the list of the clusters and the themes just to make sure I was sense checking this. And all of the kind of themes that we've had across the clusters have been attending to objects of uncertainty that are in some way kind of substantive objects that you know, you know, we, can, we can attend to through our, our, our daily lives or our practices or our institutions. But there's one thing that's come up a, a little bit in discussion and um, I think maybe we could just reflect on this a little bit. So in the plenary, to start with, we heard, I think Andy um, talked a bit about democracy needs to come into play when we are troubled with the different um, dimensions of uncertainty and we're trying to resolve these things. And often um, it has done over the years in terms of how we um, you know, make decisions under uncertainty and respond to uncertainty. So my, my point, just to get it out there, is that um, you know, should we or I would argue we should start to think a little bit more deliberately about the uncertainties of democracy, participation, and the public. And you know, just to illustrate um, this, we can probably look across a, a, a lot of ways in which forms of public representation go on across the different clusters and the different themes, and see that often there is certainty uh, that's being expressed about uh, the public you know, that's out there, whether it's through opinion surveys or through claims to the public think this or that about something like um, uh, Brexit, the public has spoken. And this comes with a radical sense of uncertainty that's attached to it, or indeterminacy, if we want to um, uh, use uh, that kind of language. And so this is important, because if we're interested in otherness, or other ways in which things are being framed about all of the objects of attention across all the clusters and themes, this becomes a pretty big deal, actually. And um, we need to then think about attending to those uncertainties of, of the public and the uncertainties that are attached to the diff many different ways in which publics are, are um, engaging with the, the objects of attention that we've been We'll be looking at whether this is extinction rebellion and all the uncertainties that are attached and the exclusions 
um, that, that go with those sorts of collecting these social innovations and social movements about farmers, seed movements that we've heard about in cluster two, um, through to you know citizens. So it doesn't matter what these things are; they are all partial and they're all um, uncertain. And yeah, we should attend to that too. Yeah. No, there you can. Anyway, it's going to be brief anyway. It's going to be longer than you thought you were going to sit here, and I never had to mind you sitting here. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm being And so I also didn't expect the idea. Um, and I'm not quite sure I am either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess Jason just raised the issue which was on my mind without having a really clear formulation as to in what way it was on my mind and why it was relevant here. But I think it's, it's also my, my discomfort, which I think many of us have expressed, uh, about the kind of conglomerated mess of uncertainties that are inevitably encapsulated or attempted to so in a title, The Politics of Uncertainty. Um, and, you know, we could equally well call it the politics of certainty. And um, for me, one of the points about the uh, the deletion of uncertainty to the extent that people can manage that in different situations is basically about a sense of insecurity, a sense of threat, and in particular in the kind of world that I've been working in to some extent acting in, a threat to their authority and their assumed authority. They've got you know, expectations of authority, had expectations of authority, which have disappeared. I'm going back to my days working on nuclear power and trying to understand why these nuclear experts were actually calling the public ignorant of the technology and the science. Of course they were. And you know, the first people to say that would be ordinary people if you went to talk to them. So the question for me was, well, how is it that they considering that to be a challenge to some view or other out there that the public has got equal knowledge that's contesting their knowledge. The point was that they were using that ignorance as an excuse to deny the legitimate difference of those publics who were opposing them. It, you know, they were wanting to construct and did actually construct quite effectively for quite a long time a world of singularity a singularity of meaning about what the issue was, what public concern should be, and what you know, what they were in the in the eyes of experts, policy, people advised by those expert news, all that kind of system of power and elitism in the policy system and the industrial system as well as involved, and the weapon system behind that. But the point is that there's a deletion of differences of meaning and of concern that's systematic. And I don't think we've yet got close to really opening up that huge, huge issue, continuing issue, in constructive and useful ways. And that includes, you know, our attempts anyway, to also recognize the need to include those observations that have already been made about you know, the, the, the insufficient participation of practitioners of a policy kind. Granted, Sheila's perfect legitimacy in pointing out that we are all practitioners as well. So if I can just put that point in, don't let's confuse the issue of uncertainty with the issue of difference and how we coexist peacefully in a world which is more riddled with difference than we seem to be able to recognize. Thank you, Brian. And I think we're gonna we're gonna finish there because that was a rather nice uh, nice summary of, of the summary of the summary of the summaries.
So thank you for everybody who uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily or unexpectedly arrived in the middle of the uh, fishbowl. Um, and thank you to everyone else. So it just leaves it to me to conclude the proceedings with, with some thanks. Um, and I think we owe quite a bit of thanks. Um, first and foremost to those who, who help fund the event, the ESRC, which continues to fund in some form or other the, uh, the STEP Center, the European Research Council that provides funds to the Pastros project that uh, helped co-sponsor this event. <coughs> but I would like actually to point much more to, to you and those who've, who've uh, been contributing so fulsomely to the discussions here. We, frankly, were a bit terrified about organizing this event because it was a bit unusual. We devolved the process of inviting everybody um, to 12 people, some of whom we knew and some of whom we didn't. And like Lenny, actually those who organized the event didn't know um, people at all, which I think has been one of the most, for me personally, the one of the most productive parts of it, to have conversations with people from very different domains, from very different uh, conceptual, practical, theoretical uh, backgrounds uh, in an incredibly productive way. So thank you particularly to the theme leads and to the audience uh, and to the, the participants who came through that route. And of course to our plenary speakers um, who we did invite and a variety of bloggers and others who, who, who were part of the, uh, of the workshop as a whole.